Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Liz Hume. I'm the acting CEO of the Alliance for Peacebuilding. And thank you for joining us here to talk about a really critical topic right now, Afghanistan and the way forward. Um, given the announcement of the US withdrawal um, coming up on 9-11 of its troops. Um, this is a really important conversation. Uh, I don't know about many of you, but for the last few weeks, I feel like I was living in an alternative universe when I would see everybody on Twitter and Facebook cheer that the 20 year forever war is now over as we pull out. Uh, you're gonna hear from many of our um, panelists today who are gonna talk about how this is, this has been an ongoing conflict for 45 years. Um, the war, you know, we might be pulling out, but it is certainly not over. Um, and the discussion really today is gonna to focus on what can we do about it, both from um, as an advocacy community, from a diplomatic development, and then also what are our red lines? Um, what can we do moving forward um, if things uh, continue to go um, to become more difficult in Afghanistan? Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Megan Corrado, who's going to be moderating and facilitating and introducing our panelists. Uh, Megan is the Director uh, for Policy and Advocacy at the Alliance for Peacebuilding and has been the person who's put all of this together. So thank you, Megan. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to you now. Great. Thank you, Liz. Um, appreciate that. Um, and thank you all for joining us uh, at home or in your office if you're lucky enough to be in one, hopefully isolated with a mask on. Um, but delighted to have everybody here. And thanks so much to our fabulous, uh, brilliant and dynamic group of panelists that we have today. Uh, so thankful to all of you for joining us. Um, so I'll quickly announce everybody um, and then we'll really just dive in because there's so much ground to cover. Um, so Sanam Ander Nagari Andalini is the founder and executive director of ICANN, also our co-host for this event. So thanks to the ICANN team as well uh, for helping to put this together. We also have Gisu Jahanagiri, who's the vice president of FIDH and the executive director of Open Asia, as well as co-president of the International Women's Film Festival. Joining us as well is Wasma Frog, co-founder and director of the Women in Peace Studies Organization, a former senior advisor on women in security and human rights for the Afghan Ministry of Defense and deputy chief mission of staff to the Ministry of the Interior. She was also the 2009 recipient of the US State Department's International Women of Courage Award. And last but not least, we have Hardin Lang joining us. He's the vice president for programs and policy from Refugees International. So thank you all again for being here and for the amazing work that you do um, just in terms of process. We want this to be more of a, a conversation than a formal panel. Uh, so I invite you all to jump in and build off each other's responses and even pose your own questions to the group. We will reserve some time at the end for audience questions. So folks tuning in, please do feel free to drop some questions in the chat. We'll be moderating them throughout um, and be sure to get to them near the end. So after 20 years of, of US intervention and, and the result in significant advances in democratic governance and the rights of Afghan women and girls, the announced unconditional withdrawal of US forces raises a lot of questions and concerns about the viability of an intra Afghan peace process, the democratically elected government, the constitution and the hard fought gains of the Afghan people. Uh, the cheers, as Liz sort of alluded to earlier, the cheers for the conclusion of one of America's forever wars has been somewhat baffling considering, considering the potential for the increased violence and the civilian impact. Um, potential for us is a serious humanitarian situation exacerbated by the pandemic, mass displacement, the crumbling of the government and civil society, and of course, regional instability. So these are all topics that we wanna dive in today. Um, so with that, let's get started. No time to waste. Um, so the one thing I will start with is Afghan women and girls, something near and dear to my heart, spent many years working with them um, in the field, seeing the resiliency, the strength, the power, the agency that they exhibit. Um, it's been sort of their, their support and um, advances have been held up as one of the you know, shining examples of, of good US work uh, in Afghanistan. But the women of Afghanistan have done the hard work. They've gone to the trainings, they've fought against the patriarchy, they fought against stereotypes, they fought against cultural norms that have, you know, during the Taliban times kept them in their house. Um, so at this time where we have women as lawyers and doctors and parliamentarians, government officials, teachers, engineers, there's a lot on the line. 
So I'd like to open um, to Wasma, have you start us off, but again, open up the conversation to everyone afterwards. You know, we know that when you work with an Afghan woman, if you give them an inch, they're gonna go a mile. Uh, so I'd like to hear your uh, thoughts on, you know, what does the withdrawal mean for the rights of advances of Afghan women and how can the US support uh, Afghan women and girls moving forward without a military presence? Thank you, Megan, and uh, thank you, everybody, for this conversation. It's very timely, especially at a time with, when uh, there's a lot of disillusion situation in Afghanistan. I, uh, I think who, uh, how Afghan women and uh, girls are reacting with the situation and the escalating level of violence is not different than the rest of the country. So Afghan women and girls do not live in an isolation. What happens to the rest of the communities impacts their lives so much. But what have we done in the past 20 years, uh, you know, is a huge example to the rest of the world. So Afghanistan, of course, Afghanistan and Afghan women were not born just with the U.S., uh, you know, led um, interventions in Afghanistan after 9-11, there's a history and, you know, the, the um, movements of women that actually have been going on in the country for so many years, which had been hampered by the uh, the civil war and uh, uh, when the, uh, so when Afghans helped, you know, the Soviet Union collapse. And then they were left alone with so much ammunition that came from the US and other countries that helped the, the Cold War. And then after that, the Civil War started, the Taliban used the vacuum, you know, and they and then this whole region and regional dynamics of Afghan conflict. So Afghan women's rights have been very much hampered during these periods because of the political situation. But what has happened in the past 20 years is, is, is a huge, like I'm one of those examples. Like sometimes when I think if, if, if these 20 years, 25 years could be taken out of my life, for example, I would have been one of maybe I would have been I would have died, you know, giving birth to, to maybe seventh or eighth child in one of the villages somewhere in Afghanistan. But the fact that I was able to go to school, the fact that I was able to get education, the fact that I was able to speak up for my people, putting up organizations together, mobilizing thousands and hundreds of, of women and, and throughout different parts of the world and speaking up for, for my people, you know, I'm a product of this, uh, the, the, this um, the timeline. So uh, the, the, but it's, it's heartbreaking right now. So, you know, many women that we, uh, in our group, they think that we are not just because we are pro-war, we want the military to stay here forever, but no, but because of the abandonment. So they feel that, you know, the, the, the US government and also the international community at large taking up so much, you know, giving so much space to an insurgent group that does not represent the majority of Afghans. We are the majority, we the women are the majority because we are more than 50 actually percent of the society, more than 60 percent of our society are the Afghans even younger than me, like under the age of 25. So, you know, there is a whole Afghan population on one side, and then there is an, a minority insurgent group that actually the reason that you don't hear the voices of Afghans against them so much is because of the fear that they continue inflicting on Afghans. So what I want to conclude here and letting other colleagues jump in is that we think that uh, Afghan women uh, and support for Afghan women in Afghanistan is a kind of a litmus test to all the international rhetoric around women, peace and security in the whole world. If, if the world, you know, abandons Afghan women right now, you know, all these international laws around women, peace and security, around 1325, you know, CEDAW, all of that becomes useless for women in my country. Because if the world does not actually use those international mechanisms to support a group that has been fighting for their rights, then we, we shouldn't even have these in, in place. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Actually, that brings me to my next question. Sanam, I'll throw this to you. You've been on the forefront of the WPS agenda, helped draft 1325. Um, I've been quite involved in the advocacy for the WPS Act of 2017, that we have the strategy now from 2019 implementation plans for DOD, State Department, USAID, and DHS. So we have legal and policy commitments in the United States to hold up and advance the WPS agenda. And we've all been saying it for months and months, Afghanistan was gonna be the test case. And if that's so, I would argue we're failing. What do you think the implications are 
to our law and policy framework to the in our the US commitments to WPS and what and if we fail to hold up these commitments, what do you think it means for the broader global agenda? Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you very much. It's great. It's, it's great to be partnering with you on this conversation. You know, one of the things I'm watching, I, I don't know whether we're being recorded and others are watching elsewhere, but in the Zoom link, we have 35 attendees. And from my go through of the names, maybe we have two, one or two guys. Right. So this actually tells you a lot that here is Afghanistan. It is on the forefront of our of our national and our foreign policy discourse. When we announced the troop withdrawal, there were 300 articles um, about the troop withdrawal stuff. Nothing about the pot, really nothing about the political process that that's been set in, set in place. And essentially, I mean, the, the issue that we have is on the one hand, we have a new administration that claims to support human rights. OK, well, we're talking about a country where 63, as, as Marjama said, 63% of the population is below the age of, uh, I have this, below the age of 25, 63%. They weren't even around when back in 9-11 happened, right? And we're about to hand over their country, not, not because we're withdrawing the troops, and, 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 and I just want to be clear about this. With troop withdrawal eventually would have happened. And I think Afghans and Wajma and many others would say, we don't want so many military and ent entities present and nobody wants that, right? But troop withdrawal is one side of the, you know, is, is the walking and the talking, the politics, pol the political process, the, the way in which we were framing this is a whole other story. And, and essentially the, the level of, I mean, I don't want to call it mockery, but it, to me, if I, if I was if I was standing outside the U.S. and and I was watching this, I'd be like, oh yeah, they say they care about human rights. Oh, they they say about global leadership and moral leadership and returning back to the international fray, etc. But look at what they're doing, and what is it that we're doing? We're basically we we are enabling a process where the analogy I can make for our, for our American colleagues is: imagine if the, the if the European Union or the Russians or the, or the security, whatever, the, some other ent big foreign power came to the US, had a direct dialogue with the Proud Boys and, and with neo-Nazi fascist groups here in the US and said, hey, you know, we, we don't, we, you know, you guys, we need to talk to you because you're actually influencing our neo-fascists back in Europe and so forth. Had a direct dialogue with them, empowered them, gave them a home elsewhere, funded them, militarized them, literally fed and clothed them and let them fly their flags. As, as we enabled Doha, the Qataris to do and, 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 the, and the Pakistanis to. And then, and then came to the, to the Biden administration and said, oh, wait, now, now go talk to them yourselves, right? I mean, to put the Taliban on equal footing with the, with the entirety of Afghan society in a peace process is setting them up and setting Afghanistan up for war forever. Basically, because because the talks are not about peace. The talks are about power, and power is defined in terms of violence. So if you're you're the Taliban here, every other warlord, elected or unelected official, a few women, you know, maybe a couple of youth are shoved in or sardined into the other side on 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 the Afghan because because we're thinking about it as two party talks, right? These these talks should be multi stakeholder. It should be okay. The Taliban is present because they're spoilers. We need them. We have to talk to them. The Afghan government. Youth representation, women's representation, minority groups, they've all, they're all there. They're all organized. We've done this before. This is, this is the nature of the way the lawyer jirgas and things that the Afghans have. Instead, we're, we're sardining it into a process which is entirely about power through violence, entirely short term, not about a vision for peace, not, not, not really about where the country is going in the future. It's only a conversation between um, the U.S. kind of the extreme kind of progressive right and Trumpian right that says, okay, we should pull out and, and in America first. And then the in-between place, and it's all about our troops. Set the troops question aside, put it through the political process. So, so this is this is something that that is is uh, is ridiculous, kind of really depressing and, and difficult to observe. If we are the country that says we have laws and we're a country of the rule of law, and we have a law that's, that's a bipartisan law that says, when we engage in the outside externally in our foreign policy, we have to engage with local women and we have to bring women's stakeholders into the peace process. And our own diplomats don't do them. Our own envoy doesn't do that systematically. One-off meetings is not, that's window dressing. That's even worse than window dressing. 
if our own envoys are not doing that and are not answerable to our own Congress about our own laws, what kind of rule of law country are we? Right? What, what kind of example are we setting for, for the world beyond? And, and I want to just on this point, I want to end with, with a couple of uh, thoughts. One of the things that, 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 we, that the United States does when it's engaged in foreign policy, when things go wrong, is we create another narrative. Right? Oh, so this one is Afghanistan's always been at war. Right. Oh, it's that they've, they, that's a kind of, well, yes and no, they're, they're at war because we're there, because the Russians were there, because we and the Russians fought there, basically, because the Pakistanis and the Indians fight over there. It's not their war. So that's one narrative that we have to question in, in terms of where, what our roles. Secondly, we say, oh, they're just corrupt. You know, things haven't worked because they're corrupt. Our own reports from DOD show that we, we as U.S. taxpayers with our money have enabled the levels of corruption that nobody had ever seen in Afghanistan. And the third thing is, there's especially on this issue right now, there's a tendency, oh, the women's stuff, the women's rights stuff, that's their culture. That's not our deal. That's, that's an internal domestic thing. Setting aside the fact that we used women's rights as the excuse to go in there in the first place in, in 2001, that was, you know, Laura Bush came, we must go fight for the Afghan women, right? It was about Osama bin Laden, but that, that, setting aside that argument, the level of hypocrisy around that, that we have Afghan women who have been fighting. All they're saying at this point is, give us our rightful seat at the table to fight for our own vision and values and so forth. And it's not just I'm there to talk about, you know, the women, it's, it's the Afghan women as talking about Afghanistan. Give us that seat. Why are we not giving them that space? Why have we not stood by them and brought them into these processes as, as, as just the norm and the de facto of what, of, of what we do? And when we get, when they talk about the culture argument and the Afghan uh, and the Taliban doesn't want to talk to uh, to women and so forth, number one, it's nonsense. They do talk to women all the time. We've all, we've all had I've I've had engagements with Taliban leaders in different international spaces, um, and and locally they do. Number two, if it's about kind of a, a, a question of we don't you know the, this is Western stuff and we don't want Western you know influences, well then let's ask them about the Western influence of using Twitter. And let's ask them about the Western influence of using the weaponry, sophisticated weaponry that comes from the West and the sophisticated medicine. You know, let, let's see how much Viagra goes down to, to, to those places, right? You can't have this level of hypocrisy that, that we, they get everything, but we don't push back when it comes to do with fundamental rights, which are ingrained in Islam. Let me say in the Quran, education rights, equality for men and women, and in, in Afghan culture and history and so forth, that that's always been there. It's our, we're letting our own ignorance kind of engage and then, and then, and then and silencing and not listening to actually the voices from the ground. So, so all in all, it's not just failure. I mean, this, this is devastating, actually. It's devastating. Thank you. Thank you for that. No, absolutely. I think, you know, going back to the previous administration and even through the current one, the diplomacy has been concession filled, concession filled, and it's only been one sided. It's been the United States taking it on our troop forces. It's been letting uh, prisoners go and we haven't seen anything in return. Any promises were obviously um, not intended to be fulfilled on the Taliban side. And, and I would argue it was a flawed process from the beginning, as you're talking about, we need a multi-stakeholder project process, not just uh, a bilateral one. So a question for everyone, you know, what levers of influence exists for the U.S. to pull at this point to ensure that women play a meaningful role in the peace process moving forward? Are there any levers? Can I um, talk? I have two images in my head as I was listening to my esteemed colleagues, uh, Salam and Wajma. One is this picture I saw this morning from a little girl on a little girl in Balakshan crossing the river to go to school with a pulley. I hope it's the right word. This has touched me. I, I even got goose pimples saying it to you right now. The second image I have is I was imagining what a mother of an American soldier listening to us right now would think. Why did my son die for the American uh, army in Afghanistan? Why exactly? Why did we go there to achieve what? Okay. Now, this mega discourses on, I mean, of course, there's an internal US discussion which is so badly needed uh, in terms of 
militarized actions. I mean, this is not the subject of our talk today, but the Afghan conflict is the occasion for you to have this talk in the same way you had this talk after Vietnam. And you need to have that talk because what is the legacy? And as Sana, my colleague was saying, it's not only the Afghan people watching what this whole business meant, but it's also all the whole world is watching it. So what does this mean? Now, just going back to the fact that one of the first uh, teaching uh, secret classes women set up in Afghanistan, because I just remind you that we were li living in sexual apartheid and girls were banned, girls and young women were banned from going to school and university, was called the, the golden needle. So they pretended it was a sewing class, but in fact, people were reading together. Afghanistan people are sophisticated people. Some of you may have Rumi's poems at your bedside. I just remind you that Rumi is from this region, the land of knowledge and schools and poetry and philosophy. So in fact, nothing is very Western in wanting to go to school and to learn, to go to university to fall in love, to get married, to be able to get out of the house and do some sports, meet people of, of your liking because they're interested in this or that. And as soon as there is no war, a little haven of peace, that's what Afghan people do, just like we all do, right? So there's nothing Western in wanting to go to school and not dying by going you know, on the road to the school. So in fact, reducing Afghan people to just people who are used to war. No one ever gets used to war, by the way. And generations are marked by war. I just remind ourselves that the Declaration for Human Rights was written by those who had suffered from fascism right after the war. And look at the ambition they had in thinking and rethinking, how do we create a new social pact? Now we can't go into a country and say, hey, we're getting rid of the bad guys. Bad and good, because I remember Mr. Bush saying they're the good Taliban and the bad. I'm still trying to figure it out. So who are these Taliban who are being uh, re-virginized? Many of whom are, unfortunately, according to international law, to which everyone adheres, criminals of war. So who are these people? Are they the good Taliban, the bad Taliban? What does that mean? Now, of course, uh, hearing the sophisticated solutions the Afghan people have. And that debate is not happening in the peace talks because as my colleague Sanam just underlined, where are the youth, the youth representatives? Where are they? They are the absolute majority in the country. They're the ones going to university, right? And planning on becoming engineers, planning on becoming writers, planning on becoming whatever, but not a warmonger. Where are they? There are extremely sophisticated circles with differing ideas of women who have clear plans about the future of education in Afghanistan, gendering education, building peace, building roads. One of the best colleagues I ever had was the, the first and I think last, and Wajma will correct me, mayor of a small town, small village. What did she do? She built a road, a road, it, it was 50 years people wanted a road. Why? To put an end to the fact that women died because they could never get, it, get them to hospital when they were uh, delivering. So it's not that women of Afghanistan, as my colleague Sarah was saying, are only thinking about what can we do to embetter our lives. By the way, they never planned or led or are engaged in war. So it's four and a half decades, they're just, you know, being extremely resilient, and they are agents, they're not just victims, of trying to get rid of this whole international law in their backyard. And it has been international law, as Saddam said. The Cold War, big superpowers trying to face each other. Then there are agents having internal wars. Now, who is who are the Taliban right now representing? That's a question as a follow-up to what Saddam said. Thank you. Thank you, Wasma, please jump in. 
Thank you. I, I think if the international rhetoric and particularly, you know, after the an announcement was made on, on uh, Afghanistan, uh, the troop withdrawal from Afghanistan, the every, you know, um, um, perspective that came from DC and beyond in the, in the West was about from the, the side of the military. Oh, yes, we this is a victory for the US, the US forces are coming out. But nobody actually starts talking about the other side, you know, like that for Afghans, this war has not ended. This war actually has intensified because of the the, the bad, bad practices that has been put into a pro process, which is called peace process. In the past two, three years, when two, two years mostly, when the US started you know, direct negotiation with the Taliban, the Taliban have received this amazing level of you know, international recognition that they do not have inside Afghanistan. People from DC think tanks started finding new careers you know, in Doha and turned into groomers for the Taliban. And they stored, started writing articles for the Taliban in New York Times, and they started promoting them. While on the other side, the same Taliban continued to flog women. You saw the video of flogging that came from Herat, west of Afghanistan. You saw, for example, just th this week, the way the car bomb that the, the uh, you know, attack happened in Logar province, they killed over 30 young boys who were getting ready for university entrance for Concour exam. They have closed the girls' schools. In my own province, in Maidan Wardak, for example, we have a female uh, um, um, mayor, you know, but in some parts of the, uh, the, the province, we do not even have a high school for girls because they do not allow it. They continue to, to close it. So we, we are very much, you know, many of our Af Afghans are wondering where does this rhetoric keep coming from? Why are, you know, the world becoming, you know, spokesperson for the Taliban while they continue killing us? In this past week, for example, six provinces have direct attacks from the Taliban. People are being killed. Last night in Baghlan, you know, they, well, they actually, I tweeted this, the picture that came from my colleagues, how they have burned down a market and then uh, the Afghan forces have been fighting. So what we are asking the world is actually, please try to make it, to actually pick the, the, the sides that you are taking, whose sides you are taking in this war. Are you siding by the women who are struggling, being, you know, killed, but still the journalists who, who died, but still women are reporting on the, on the news lines. You see the local media, still the women are reporting. The women judges have been killed on the streets of Kabul, but still, you know, the women judges continue their work. I worked in the Ministry of Defense and Interior where we had police and army. These women are doing special, uh, you know, um, searches and special operations. These women are doing that. These girls are doing that. So what I'm asking actually the people of the United States is that please, just ask that question, whose side are you taking? Are you taking the sides of a group that continues killing Afghans or you are taking the sides of Afghan people and Afghan women who are actually setting an example for the rest of the world that despite there is a war there, we are still, we are still struggling. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I mean, I think something we really saw when the United States started direct talks with the Taliban is they legitimized them. They legitimized them, considered them maybe a government in waiting, whatever the thought was, it, they made them a legitimate actor in this peace negotiation. So now what we need to do is think about how do we delegitimize them in the same way uh, as they continue to escalate violence, if they refuse to come back to the table through the Afghan process, you know, what can we do to do that? Is it sanctions? Is it delisting? Is it not delisting them? Is it... Um, you know, working with regional powers, I think there's a, a long way to go. I'm not sure if anyone wants to jump in on that point. Hi, Megan. Uh, just what, one point I would make before we perhaps get a little bit into the humanitarian situation, but on the peace process, I do wonder at this stage how, I mean, what we can expect, right, from the peace process. Um, my sense of this would be whatever if there was ever any real sincere desire on the part of the Taliban to seek some elements of a negotiated solution, particularly with respect to the departure of the United States, some of those objectives, I think, have been largely achieved at this stage. So I'm, it's not clear to me why they would engage in, if we could reorganize, right, the structure of the peace process at this stage, 
um, I'm not sure what role or what we would expect from the Taliban in that conversation in terms of reaching a, you know, lower levels of violence or even sort of a possible, you know, peaceful outcome to this. I mean, if we, it's very important to sort of wa watch where they walk and not what they talk, right? And if you look at the levels of violence around the country over the last, you know, couple of days, certainly since, you know, the announcement was made, it's very clear that, you know, they're attempting to press what appears to be where they have military advantage, they're attempting to press that, right? So maybe this is part of a wider strategy to engage, engage in negotiation, but I'd be very interested to hear from sort of Afghan colleagues and others, you know, do they actually see uh, a real utility in a peace process at this stage, even if we could reorganize it, right? Along the lines of what should have been done originally with in terms of multi-stakeholder participation. I'm happy to jump in, and I'm sure my my colleagues will. Um, so I, th I think it's I think it's a couple of I mean this this is about negotiation strategy and lever leverage and 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 so forth. But if you go by, let's say their own word, right? They've said that they care about uh, the violence that's gone on. They say that they care about the issues. They they were forced to issue a statement about women's rights uh, uh, last week at some point, right? So and this is thanks, by the way, to all of the ongoing noise and pressure and advocacy and so forth that 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 uh, that has happened both um you know very much at the local level and and by people risking their lives um and and international um but again let, let let's say that you know and, and of course they have a constituency they have their their own widows and others that, that that they have to deal with um why not have the other stakeholders in the room why not have afghan young afghan people you know men and women in the room talking to them about what's the future. Why not have women, Afghan women directly sitting there and say, okay, let's go through this one by one, education, this, that. Over there, you're fining us. Over there, you're flogging us. Over there, you're poisoning us. And, and if they are, um, if they're serious about uh, not being, you know, if, if there's violence and they turn around and they say, oh, that wasn't us. Well, then why not have a de-escalation commission, joint de-escalation commission on the ground to investigate these acts of violence. Why not? Why aren't, why aren't they condemning the violence, right? Put some level of accountability, bring them, you know, bring them into the, if this is about peace and living together, right? Or if, they, if this is about them thinking that they have legitimacy, then they shouldn't be afraid of demonstrating that legitimacy in discussions with a cross section of Afghan um, uh, stakeholders. If families are victims on both sides, um, as I say, women peace builders who are on the ground providing the services. For, and, and, and here's the issue. These are not peace talks. Okay, Peace talks would be about, okay, what does peace mean? What does it look like in 10 years time for us? What is it that we want for our daughters and sons? And actually that would be a far more productive conversation because the minute you bring it down to what do you want, you, Mr. Whoever it is, and what for our children, for our country, for our waterways, and for our that's a much more productive conversation. And, and you can break it down when they say, we don't want, we, we want an Islamic state. If you have the right people in the room, they can ask, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by Islam? That's the conversation I had with them, right? Oh, we don't want corruption. Oh yes, okay, corruption. Let's talk about corruption. In my country of birth, we ended up with an Islamic government that was meant to come in with no corruption and no, you know, nasty influences from the outside world. It is the most socially corrupt. The levels of prostitution and drug addiction in Iran are beyond anything we've ever seen under the quote unquote Islamic regime, right? Let's have that conversation with them. See how much they care about that. But you, that's why you need inclusive mediation teams and inclusive, you know, different stakeholders around the table to figure out where the commonalities are and then where the divergences are. But having, trying to, again, trying to sandwich everybody into the government delegation, which includes all sorts of other power brokers and violent actors, right? And then on the other hand, putting them here and, and somehow kind of treating them with kid gloves as if they, they represent, you know, anything they say about Islam or, or Afghan society and Afghan culture is, is you know, can't be touched. That, that is absurd. Let them talk about, let, let them talk to their own people about, about these, these issues. And again, coming back, 
51% of the population is female. 63% is under the age of 25. Do they even know what these people are going through right now? Right? And, and, and again, the hypocrisy, where are their own kids and their own families and, and, and so forth? So, so, so definitely, I think the process right now can be, can be shifted to, to bo both to humanize it and put the, put the question around peace and responsibility sharing, not power sharing. Let's flip it. Responsibility for providing the food and the water and all the things that 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 that, that Wajma mentioned, but but um, but also to 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 make it so that it's uh, it, the, the levels of accountability. It's not just that that they understand that they are one of many actors in in, in the space. Thank you. You say please jump in. You'll be surprised. I mean, the Sanam is underlining an extremely important issue which is what's happening is not a peace process, okay? It's, a, it's not a peace process. It, many of my Afghan colleagues and friends, every time there's a delay in, the, in actually having one of the meetings, you know what they say? They're like, oh, thank God, we still have another few days before we're put on sale and the power is given to the Taliban. It, it, it's really amazing. Uh, but if there were a peace process, as Sanam was saying, around something which is transformative justice, how can any peace be imagined without justice? Um, this, does, this concept doesn't exist. How can peace be imagined if everyone gives themselves blanket amnesty? What are a wronged, what is a wrongdoing in a given country or space or community and what is right? The one who destroys a building of a school and sets fire to it is equal to the teacher who never gets a salary and goes to work every day. Are these on equal par? So I'm not sure to what extent, and you can see that there's lots of noise being made trying to persuade the Afghan people, this is a peace process. But there is no belief in that. So I think this is a very important point that we need to put forward. And the second issue is that I know that an army has to finally go back home. What is the legacy of having been there for 20 years? How come American taxpayers are not wondering, despite the huge um, corruption that you referred to by your colleague Sana, on all sides, by the way, not only in how, uh, not only on the receiving end, also on the distributing end, you know, the shadow schools, you know, schools which were funded and et cetera, but never existed, et cetera. Okay. The question is, what is the legacy we leave? Do we want to make sure that in the heart of Asia for the next 10, 20, 30 years, we're going to have new foyers of war? That's a question, it's a valid question. I think taxpayers should be asking their administration. Two, are we happy that there is a migration or a flow of millions and millions of people? Some make it to the US, some go to the allies in Europe, some die in the Mediterranean, thank God. I'm sorry, of course I'm saying this in inverted commas. Uh, three, do we want to be strengthening the international violent extremism, wherever it is, by finding again a safe haven for it. I, if I remember well, the whole Bin Laden issue was should, Afghanistan should not become a safe haven, one of the geographical seats of, 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 of these uh, uh, violent uh, extremist ideas. And finally, what does Islam have to do in the middle of all this? It's nothing to do with it. It's not linked to Islam that some people who are killers, assassins, school destroyers, water poisoners, are creating a climate of fear where people cannot even look into their eyes and are ready just to you know, go back behind those windows that each family was obliged to put black uh, material or tissues in case someone sees the, uh, the, the, the face of a woman or a girl imprisoned apartheid for women. What does this have to do with any religion? I have not heard of any religion which advises that. So I think this is making fun of millions and millions of people. Mm. People know how to run their own countries. 
if from the start, the most violent, crazy minorities are not groomed, strengthened, trained. And as Wajman, my colleague was just telling us, or just recently, using the most sophisticated, expensive weapons in the best military outfits, which are super duper right now. Uh, so the question is, could we understand who is financing, who is training, which schools or military schools in neighboring countries are training, producing them 24 hours a day? We have a new generation of Taliban. It's not the same old guys 20 years ago. So why is this frontier between Afghanistan and Pakistan not just normalized according to international law? So that whoever wants to enter Afghanistan has a visa or doesn't have a visa, doesn't receive one. What are these issues that we're just putting aside and thinking that this, as the French say, braderie sale of the constitution of Afghanistan, which is a good constitution. All constitutions can become better, but it was a good, it was a snapshot of a social pact agreed on at a given moment with, with, good, with good laws. Anyways, who is allowing whom to put this on sale. Uh, and if I could add a little bit on, on some of my perspectives on the peace process as well as that. So uh, right now, what we call the peace process, it has not started on an equal footing from the beginning. The US made a deal with the Taliban, excluding the Afghan government and, and a government that people voted for. Yes, we have issues of corruption. Yes, we have issues of service provision and, and, and a lot of, and what do you expect in a war zone that continues to fight and also runs a country. So um, uh, the US government, when they made this deal, they. Uh, excluded the Afghan government from the beginning. Ta Taliban are living in lavish, you know, VIP uh, kind of uh, hospitalities and Doha, some of their, uh, you know, the families they brought, their kids are going to school. So uh, how Western things are about when they go to English medium schools in, in Qatar, but it's Western when my daughter goes to school. Uh, so uh, the hypocrisy on the peace process. So what uh, you cannot have a peace process with two very, you know, with two sides without a mediator, at least a neutral a mediator. So mediation is, is an important part of the peace process that we need an international mediator who can bring the sides together and who does not favor the sides, right? So what has happened is that one side has been favored. The other side tries to keep up with the, the legitimacy that the other side has been getting. The Afghan government, the Afghan people. That, so the international mediation and also learn what we have done in other countries. Colombia is a good example. The, you know, learning from those examples, how people have been part of the process, supporting the local, you know, um, constituencies for peace building in, in Afghanistan, because no peace can actually happen in Doha. And then while people continue being killed on, on in Afghan. Uh, you know, uh, communities. So the root of the conflict, if that is not addressed, what peace are we talking about? So that is like a, another crux of the matter that what is this root of the conflict? And we and colleagues talked about, you know, so the Taliban use RDX. Um, it's an explosive, which I've only heard in some of the Bollywood and Hollywood movies only. Uh, they use that in their car bombs and other bombings that they do in other in communities. Afghanistan does not produce those. Where do these come from? The Taliban that we had seen in the 90s with their flip-flops, you know, in some in old clashing coats, now they use drones. Uh, they have even drones uh, to actually attack communities. Where does all of this ammunition come to the Taliban? The Taliban continue visiting the regional countries. They were in Turkmenistan, they were in Iran, they were in China, they were in Moscow. How did that happen? You know, like, so no peace process. We need sanctions on the Taliban. The Doha office has to be threatened. If they are not ready to, you know, cease fire, if they are not ready to, to stop the, the bloodshed, that office needs to be closed. Why should we have, whose money is being, you know, this was the taxpayers the whole past two years who fed the Taliban with, you know, and now all of them have actually are dealing with obesity now. And in these past two years, whose money went into all those dinners and, and, and keeping in the hospitalities. The other point that I also want to say is that US should really prevent making a strategic blunder in its history because what's happening is that 
in this whole Central Asia and South Asia, you only had Afghanistan as, a, as an ally. You had Iran, you had China, you have Russia, for example, none of them are, are fond of the US in this region. So if Afghanistan, if the US loses the grounds in Afghanistan and does not have allies in Afghanistan, then it's also an, another, I, I, I believe, that region. The last thing I want to also raise is that Afghanistan's issue is not Afghans anymore because why, what happens is that violent extremist groups have an international you know, outreach to each other. Al-Shabaab has already started congratulating the Taliban that you have taken out the US out. So how the violent extremist groups inside Afghanistan will reach out, you know, have already reached out to the so many violent extremist groups of Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, you know, Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda already started saying, you know, we are, we are taking your back and that's what happened 20 years back. So when violent extremism also takes over, and that, that you know, is, is another kind of a dilemma we are going to have on top of that, this fear of Afghan civil war, because not everybody wants the Taliban in Afghanistan. We have so many ethnic groups who think the Taliban and who have been actually massacred. The Hazaras have been massacred by the Taliban. The Uzbeks have been massacred by the Taliban. They are arming themselves, you know, in, in many parts of the country, they are arming themselves against it. So a peace process needs to happen on an equal footing, bringing all these parts of the, of the society Maybe give the Taliban not 15 seats when you have a 30 people delegation. Give the Taliban five seats. Bring, you know, give the 25 seats to our one population, five seats to women, five seats to politicians. And, you know, like how we women have been mobilizing. I get requests from political leaders who say, can you promote our agenda as well? Because they see how women have been so much mobilizing themselves. So women are not just mobilizing for women rights. They are mobilizing for the whole country. The political leaders are asking us for help to promote their agendas so that they could be part of this process. Thank you. And um, I'll throw to you, and then I'd like to turn to humanitarian issues and, and bring in Hardin. Sure. I, I just, um, just on this question of the implications of where things are going, two weeks ago, the you know, I, or one of the um, Taleb groups in Pakistan, Taleb, Pakistani Taleb, had basically blockaded Islamabad. Okay. Uh, there, there was some, uh, my, President Macron, the French, French president, had said something, it had upset them. So they were basically mobilized on the streets and they were calling for the death of the French ambassador and the withdrawal of all, France was withdrawing, withdrawing all of its citizens from Pakistan. Um, to, to, and and to, to watch ones, to think that this process isn't being watched by every other extremist group globally, um, to say, oh, yeah, it works. You know, they are global, these groups are globally connected and locally rooted. This is, they have the same global vision and then locally they, they play around and they're very sophisticated in terms of how they tap into whatever the latest grievance or the la latest aspirations and, and, and so forth. Um, just yesterday, ISIS bombed, um, uh, 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 de 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 detonated a bomb in the Maldives, right? Our, our partners in the Maldives have been saying this for a long time. ISIS is present. ISIS is every, you know, so, so from the US standpoint, if this is a general shift, if, if the US is basically looking at the world and saying, you know what, we're out of there, we're going to pull out and we don't, you know, good luck to all of you, that's the way it is, it, then, then at least admit that, right? The, the Trump administration at some point said America first, that's what, you can't, you can't say we believe in human rights and we want to be a global leader and, and at the same time behave in the way that, 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 that we're doing. And, and it's dangerous on another level in that we said 9-11, we're going to pull out our troops. That's a very important symbolic date. No one's going to forget that. And on the back of it already, it was like, well, we're going to have some security officers in the embassy and we're going to have this. And we're gonna... that murkiness, that, that lack of clarity cuts so much into the grain and the, and the mistrust that people from, from that region, Iranians, Afghans and others, have of the, of, of the Americans. Right, You're, it's basically not a trustworthy counterpart, and and so the levels of again violence and potential instability that we're creating against Western, you know, are we are we going to pull out all the embassies and, and shut shut the door? Is is that what we're going to do? And if we do that, who's gonna who's gonna fill that gap? Well, guess what? Saudi Arabia already has huge influence between Pakistan and and the Wahhab and the Taliban because of the Wahhabi ideology. Russia's over there. Iran, you know, we're making the deals with Iran, which is actually really, really important. 
But you want to have some presence in, ter in terms of mitigating the kind of ideology and the kinds of forces that that these guys are going to be um, that could they, they could be potentially using. So it, it's it's very short sighted. What we're doing is super, super short sighted. Maybe it's good for the two year election cycle in this country, but it really isn't. I, it's not good. It's not good on on multiple that the negatives are much, much more. And there are things that we can still do. As I said, the multi stakeholder thing. Don't delist the Taliban from from sanctions lists. The, the individuals that are on it. Don't release another seven thousand prisoners. I don't know how much people. We're we're sort of opening. We're saying here, get take, take get them all out, and then we're walking out the door. If we're walking out anyway, let the Afghans at least have something to leverage with. Why are we literally handing up everything? I don't know whether what we're not even giving the um, security equipment, the police and the, and the military equipment that we have there to the Afghan forces who are doing the fighting. Right. So so it, it's it, it you know, we put thousands of soldiers there to die, to be maimed, to kill, to come back with trauma, unbelievable burden on the military families in the U.S. and the U.K. and elsewhere. Not not. And, and we don't even know the, the, the burden on the Afghan civilian and military population. But let's just domestically this. We did all of this for what? For what? We asked them to have the courage of our convictions, but our own diplomats don't have the conviction of their own convictions. And they're not, you know, it, it's, it, it's such a uh, kind of topsy-turvy um, sort of rabbit hole that we've gotten ourselves into. And, and we need to get out of it. And there are, as I said, there are things that we can do in terms of the, the, the politics and the security side of the story. Thank you. Thank you, Sanam. Yeah, and your point about the regional issues, um, so that sort of brings me to Hardin and, and your thoughts on, you know, what, the withdrawal overall and potential destabilization will will have an effect in terms of the humanitarian situation, displacement, refugee. You know, many are predicting a re refugee crisis. You know, what are you thinking about? What is Refugees International thinking about? What are you forecasting? And what do you think that will? What implications will there be for regional stability? Thank you, Megan. Um, just first off, the, you know, listening to the conversation. Um, and thank you very much for everyone's, you know, thoughts and input on it. It's really sort of refreshing to, to get sort of a, a real honest sort of brass tacks conversation about the stakes that are involved and the stakes that have been made. And it's really fascinating. Like I'm, I'm old enough to remember, you know, when I was in the United Nations, like conversations around the bond process, right? And, you know, the original sin of having left out um, perhaps the Taliban and other interlocutors in those conversations. And in a way, we're committing the same sin in a different way <laughs> um, now in terms of having first not had the Afghan government in the conversation initially in those dialogues, and even now in the way in which the peace table has been arranged, right? That you have, you know, civil society, uh, you know, women leaders, so many other people not represented in the way that they need to. So, you know, this is not a, this is not a new mistake um, that we, <laughs> that, the, that United Nations, but more particularly in this case, the U United States has made. Um, but what I would say is I, I am at this stage of the game, I am a little concerned that even if the U.S. pushed very hard to do everything that we're talking about around the table in terms of the participation at the peace table, I'm concerned that you know, if I were the Taliban in this moment, I'm not sure that conversation is where the lion's share of my effort would be. Um, my sense is, and sort of watching, looking what they're doing on the ground, that we are going to see heightened levels of conflict. Uh, and I think everyone sort of around the table would probably agree with this, that um, it, it is unlikely, you know, that the situation is probably going to get worse before it gets better on a security and stability front. And the humanitarian implications of this are going to be pretty severe. And you say that, as colleagues have already mentioned, you know, you have half the population in Afghanistan that under like a UN assessment already are in need of humanitarian assistance. That, uh, you know, you have seven, over 17 million people who are facing acute levels of malnutrition. Uh, and, you know, one in two children under the age of five by the end of the year expected to face acute malnutrition. So you combine sort of the conflict, drought, uh, the implications of the pandemic together, and you have this sort of this perfect storm right, uh, of humanitarian concern and, and, a and a response, an international humanitarian response, which is massively underfunded, right? And then layer on top of that, a ratcheting up in conflict in a country that already has four plus million people displaced internally, still 2.2 million uh, uh, refugees in the immediate region. You know, 
last year, there were over 300,000 people who were displaced by violence. Uh, and we're seeing some of those numbers begin to tick up already this year. The trend lines are very clearly headed in a very negative direction. Now, let's look, and I would like to break it down into four pieces, right? There's what's happening inside of Afghanistan, the regional implications, uh, implications for and, and policies for our European colleagues and allies, and then the United States, right? And uh, internally, my concern is that you already see the US embassy drawing down, right? You see them saying back people who are quote unquote non-essential staff. And I, I think it's fair to assume much of the aid platform in Afghanistan is, you know, the international elements of it are Western. Uh, some of them actually are able to operate in Taliban controlled areas and provide a lot of humanitarian assistance in Taliban controlled areas. Um, but that humanitarian assistance is going to increasingly become a political football. You know, in, in this conversation, the Taliban are going to be imposing concern, like conditions on how that assistance is being done. So my, you know, sort of plea on this to this government would be, and also to the United Nations and others, are really to sort of work to reconfigure or really focus on sort of a principled response, which is, you know, uh, neutral and impartial in nature, but also that really doubles down on investments in local Afghan organizations, right? Because you're going to see Western uh, aid workers pull out. And quite frankly, you know, it's always the Afghans who know the situation better than the international presence. They always know what communities need better than anyone who looks like me knows what they need. And so really doubling down on, you know, a commitment to localization in Afghanistan, to invest in civil society, and to make sure that they've got the sort of resources at their disposal to, to meet the kind of needs we're going to see inside of Afghanistan. Pivoting to the regional level, I, I think it's hard to ignore the fact that you're going to see significant outflows into Pakistan, I think in Iran, the, the numbers have been going the other way, right? During the pandemic, the situation became so difficult in Iran for Afghans, right? That it, you had over 800,000 people come back, right, into Afghanistan, into a very difficult situation because they just didn't have, there was no refuge really anymore in Iran in terms of access to services. And I think moving forward, it is going to be incumbent upon the donor community to find a way to, you know, share responsibility with Pakistan and others in terms of providing opportunities for Afghans who may need to seek refuge outside the region or outside of the country and in the region. Uh, and there are a series of different initiatives that we can look at, compacts, et cetera, about getting access to labor markets, et cetera. And no one wants to talk about this, no one wants to think about it, but I think it's, it's something that's coming our way. The other thing is, you know, as the United States unplugs our security architecture and walks out the door, you know, the Europeans are doing something similar uh, inside of the, the confines of the NATO ISAF mission, which actually has a much bigger troop presence at the moment than the U.S. does on the ground. Uh, and as they sort of move out, I think it will also be incumbent upon the Europeans to sort of change the way in which they deal with Afghans who are migrating or, or seeking refuge or international protection in, in some European countries. I mean, quite up right now, you have massive deportations going on, with people being sent back from Europe into Afghanistan. And... I, I would challenge any sort of, you know, uh, European nation state to, to, to undertake a proper sort of assessment of the situation in Afghanistan and think that that's somehow not refoulement, right? The, deport, the deportations at this stage are sending people back into very significant danger. And we also see throughout the sort of the, the migration flow pathway, you know, through Turkey and elsewhere that Afghans quite often, you know, you know there are Afghans in, uh, uh, Syrians in Turkey, refugees in Syrians in Turkey have certain rights, right? That are not extended to their Afghan colleagues or their uh, brethren. And so we're gonna have to, there's, a, there's an architecture of protection at an international level that we're really gonna have to double down on and do a lot of work. But at the end of the day, United States, because we are so much part of this, of the, the dynamics and the events moving forward, we bear a very special responsibility in this, right? And so all those different elements, we need to be playing a role in helping to coordinate, support, uh, uh, and strengthen the international protection architecture as it applies to Afghanistan, and then particularly aid inside the country. In the United States, the conversation has very much been around SIV, right? And, and those people who were in the military, et cetera, who worked with our forces abroad. And I think, of course, that program needs to be strengthened and, you know, but as someone who was just involved in the effort to sort of push very hard on the Biden administration to raise the cap uh, on refugee readmission, that program is not going to solve <laughs> the situation that Afghans face. So the kind of leadership that we are going to need to show, uh, the U.S. government is going to need to show with respect to the humanitarian situation, not just in Afghanistan, but the ripple effects in the region and then wider with our European colleagues is a a mantle that we cannot set down, right? And that one, those of us who work sort of in advocacy on the outside will be pushing very hard to see a much more robust role uh, in that effort moving forward. 
Thank you, Harden. That's really helpful. Yeah, I mean, I think there has been a lot of conversation on the SIVs and rightly so. Um, and I think this has been a conversation ongoing for a long, long time, basically throughout the entire conflict. Um, and I think the a lot of the advocacy has actually come from the US military and vets who have worked with these Afghan as translators who saw them put their lives on the, on the line. Um, so yeah, it's something we really need to revisit with this administration and a broader infrastructure that can account for the massive influx. So thank you for that. So I want to turn now to development assistance. Um, when the president announced that he was going to withdraw troops by 9-11, they did say that they were going to provide 300 million in additional civilian assistance. I think I'd like to hear what do you think um, that assistance should look like? What would actually be most helpful to the situation given the lack of military sort of presence there? And can it be effective? And what would you say about sort of calls from Congress that are a little nervous about putting, who have long supported development assistance in Afghanistan, but are a little nervous about providing more at this juncture, given the uh, political and um, sort of in political instability and, and the potential for an uptick in violence? Go ahead, Gisu. I'm sorry, just a few lines before my colleagues uh, pick on that. The Congress is right to be nervous. In what sense? In the sense that the administration may be ill-advised by the traditional advisors it has had on what they call the Afghan, uh, the Afghan dossier. They may be ill-advised. I mean, um, they are right to worry about the fact that uh, this ticking bomb, which not the military pullout is creating. It's not that. It's not the military pullout which is creating this ticking bomb. It's the green light which has been giving to those who are ardently in favor of destroying their destructors. They don't want roads. My father nearly got killed in Afghanistan. He was a road builder and had done a study around the country and he was kind of arrested for a day or two. And the guy says, okay, we won't kill you. But go back and tell people we don't want roads here. T Taliban guys, just go back and say we don't want roads. People are anti-development. So on one, on one side, I really think that we can't expect Afghans to be hit suddenly by amnesia about their recent history. And I hope that the US administration is not hit by amnesia either. Because I can't just imagine the billions of dollars which have been used and the millions of hours spent on each step, including development policies uh, for Afghanistan. I really think there is need that the brokers and the advisors update themselves. Afghanistan has sociologically evolved. This is not Afghanistan of the Mujahideen fighting the Soviets in the mountains and the, top, and the tops of the hills. It's not that. Right? It's not that. So I think that's one issue. And the second issue is obviously, as someone, I think Saran was saying, it's not only a question in belief in human rights. Uh, the US is bound by its human rights obligations also. It's not only just this time, I don't wanna have it on my list, next time I'll add it on, it's, it's binding. And so I understand why Congress is worried, but Congress would be, questioning much more what political actions have been envisaged and why is it that a green card, I, I just saw a note here in the chat, someone put it there, we're worrying about the 7,000 Taliban prisoners being freed and Mr. Khalilzad has says, well, we have to give them something. I don't understand this logic. You are giving them the country, you're giving them impunity you are maybe giving them arms. I'm, I'm sorry, God forbid. I hope it's not the case. Uh, and you, on top of it, want to give them 7,000 more soldiers. And as Wajma has mentioned recently, we're only talking about a group of 30,000, maybe, maybe if we're very generous, 100,000 people who are being armed to the teeth and are now determining a dark age again. Thank you. Thank you. Hardin, please. 
Well, I just wanted to flag the fact that um, the impact of the concern over development assistance is very real now, right? It's being felt on the ground already. You know, donors are beginning to pull back. We're seeing uh, donors who engage in sort of recovery and resilience efforts, uh, which fall a little bit outside of just immediate humanitarian response in that sort of gray area outside of uh, humanitarian aid, say that like this is not something that they really want to engage in, and particularly doing that in Taliban controlled areas. And so what's interesting is that like, it, it's, it's already beginning to complicate efforts to meet needs. Um, and my concern on this is like, you know, this is not news to anybody on this call, but every time we've seen sort of US drawdown of troops or commitment anywhere in the world, the aid budgets always very quickly fall right out the door, right? So it, it's great that we've said the Biden administration has signaled its commitment to you know, continue and maybe increase levels of assistance, but there is no longer, like, you lose the political constituency in Congress for that moving forward. And so I think there is a lot of work to be done to try to sort of strengthen that spine and to maintain a constituency for that kind of development aid moving forward in Afghanistan, because my fear is it is very quickly going to sort of fall off the map in the next year or two uh, as U.S. troops depart or with the departure of U.S. troops. And we have so many examples of that happening in the past. So for us in the advocacy community, I think that is a real significant challenge and call to action uh, over the period of time to come. I just want to jump in on this on, on, uh, on the back of Hardin's points. Um, two things. Number one, if you look at <clears throat> Iraq around 2014, when we pulled out and we pulled out all our aid, guess who filled the vacuum? It was ISIS. And then, and then the spinoff of all the other stuff that happened with that, right? I remember we had Iraqi colleagues. We, we did a, at, at ICANN, we did a brief, um, our series called What the Women Say back then. And we're saying, this is, as, as the U.S. As the US uh, pullout was happening, we did an analysis of like, what are the trends that are coming? And, and we, were, we were predicting it because al-Baghdadi was already in public making comments about, about what was gonna happen, right? Um, so that's, when you leave a vacuum, somebody fills it. And, and that's a really dangerous thing that we've seen. And we saw it with, with you know, the Soviets that we didn't go into Afghanistan back in 1980 whenever it was, and guess guess who, uh, it was the Taliban that filled it. So, so let's, let's not forget those lessons. The second thing, and this I may be, um, you know, I know that in Washington, when you, when you criticize the administration's uh, policies or something, your access to the White House is, is diminished. Well, I never had access to the White House. I don't worry about that um, so much. I'd rather just say what I, what I wanna say, but, but, but my next comment may also upset a few of my, our colleagues here in DC. Somehow, international organizations that get a lot of the money that the 300 million or however millions and billions that we have supposedly spent for civilian uh, development in Afghanistan and elsewhere, that you know, it's big contracts that US organizations or UK organizations and others get, they are not in the business of actually enabling and strengthening the organizational capacities of the local organizations with whom they partner and who they call implementing partners. It's always, you know, tons of money that come. And somehow when it comes down to actual implementation, Wajma's organization or, or the other types of local organizations that are on the ground doing the work, get a tenth, maybe one hundredth, maybe one thousandth of the actual budget that is allocated. And it's always program project based. It's not about building out their, their organizations so that they can deepen the bench, that they have the capacities and, and, and so forth to, to actually apply for their own funds separately and, and basically be independent of their, of the sort of the umbilical cord that ties them to the big international organizations, right? So if we're going to say, if we're saying, oh, we're going to give another $300 million here, which by the way, compared to everything else that's happening is, 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 a, is a drop in the ocean, we better be really specific about how much of that money is literally going into the hands of Afghans, Afghan entities, uh, whether it's governmental or non-governmental entities that are providing the services, and really enabling them to stand on their own feet. We saw this with Iraq that 20 years, it was emergency or whatever, but it wasn't really about building those foundations from the ground up. It doesn't take much, it doesn't take much money to do that. It takes a lot of effort and, and commitment and believing in the fact that you're gonna, you're gonna enable your, your local partners respectfully to be able to do what they want, to trust their decisions, to, to provide the, the sort of the, the or sort of financial administrative, et cetera, structures that they need, the technological structure that they need. So, so that you, if you're gonna go, you go. 
but but let's let's look at where all this money actually goes. And again, the cigar reports consistently show how much of the money gets wasted and, and, and so forth by by contractors for pro- a lot of them are for profit. It's money that's meant to go to Afghanistan. It's U.S. tax money, and it's going into the profits and the coffers of for-profit companies sitting in Washington. That's that's you know I'm, my taxes. That's not where I want my taxes to go. I don't know what other people think. Right. So 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 there's there's a lot of that stuff as well in terms of in terms of again if we're thinking about being responsible if we're thinking about rule of law and good practices and all these things that we kind of espouse good governance that we espouse out in the world and and we have think tanks in Washington who who, who sort of claim to be to be promoting um, responsible you know whatever statecraft or governance et cetera et cetera um, from the right or the left. Okay. Mm. So my uh, two cents on the development aid, I don't see it different or isolated from the political situation, because if you have a government, for example, if the Taliban um, take over the militarily, you know, the, the power uh, and then the world thinks, OK, we are putting in money, uh, how would that money actually reach to, reach to people? Of course, is a big question. The Taliban um, have already limited, you know, the access of the organizations to communities uh, who, like we have had reports from the UN, even WFP and many other organizations whose female staff had been stopped, whose staff who have been actually asked by the Taliban to pay, they paid the Taliban so that they could reach the, to the community. So the money ends up, you know, not, not just the fear that it goes through these contractors who are asked to do development, uh, just the way, you know, we had military contractors to do peace building or which really kind of made, created chaos like mm-hmm. Dynacorps, Blackwater, many others, for example. Similarly, um, the development is, is, is like in that situation, but also humanitarian crisis is ongoing. So when 50% of the country are facing humanitarian crisis, development has no meaning to them, right? The, the first thing is the basic <coughs> needs. So addressing those basic needs is also very critical because what the war has done, it has actually limited people's access to services. So despite the fact that, you know, there would be money there, but it can't reach to people. Just this last two, two, three days, the Taliban exploded the poles uh, of electricity that comes from Uzbekistan. So right now, Kabul is dark because they have actually, you know, destroyed the those electricity poles that come from the north. So despite the fact that there might be, you know, money, it, it's its ability to reach to communities is one question, but you can't think of development if there is a humanitarian crisis and don't see developments separate from the political. I used to work, you know, with humanitarian organizations under the Taliban, and we were never allowed to do any of our development work in Afghanistan. We used to actually, you know, help some women groups in different parts of the country with uh, to raise um, to do these the kitchen gardening and with that we used to write alphabets so that helped the girls so they, they learn alphabets on the mat and then we had one child outside the door who would shout when they, are, they would see a talib coming and then we would keep cleaning the mat so that they don't see that we are teaching this girl uh, alphabet so that was the level of you know taliban's resistance to education which is a basic right so i'm i'm not very sure what kind of development would actually work if this political situation continues to be like this Thanks. Thanks, all. So now I'll get in trouble with you a little bit. I think um, you're spot on, though. The fact that there has been so much money injected into Afghanistan, but not at the local level. I mean, it's a problem all over the world in not just USG funding, you know, UN funding, other European fundings, because we're not taking the time to consult with the local actors and what do you need? What kind of program should we design? What are the activities that will be effective in your particular context? And how do we monitor and evaluate that in a way that we can replicate scale, you know, make it as effective as possible or learn lessons from if it doesn't, you know, fully succeed. So that's something I think we need to be uh, addressing as we move forward as well. Harden, um, I'm not sure if your hand is still up or just from before, or do you want to jump in? No, it was up from before. Go ahead, please. Oh, no worries. Um, so to what extent, if any, can um, the U.S. take steps to ensure that local civil society and peacebuilding organizations are involved in 
you know, the local. So if we can't maybe have this big peace process in Doha or wherever, what can we do to support local level peace builders, which have been doing this hard work for the last 45 years? You know, it's been the women often negotiating with the Taliban to get access to a bridge to get to, you know, the market or whatever. So this work has been going on for a long time and has been effective. So how do we at least support those folks in the fields um, as we sort of deal with this ever evolving uncertain future? Uh, I, uh, my two cents on that. Um, so two things. I think number one, it is important to make sure that the funds, um, they're sustained multi-year core funds being given to a, a variety of local, very localized Afghan organizations and, and so forth that, that, that are there so that they can adjust and adapt and do whatever it is that, that, that they want to, what, what they want to do, what they need to do and, and so forth. We have, um, I, I'll give you an example from, from some of our work. So around the, with the COVID crisis um, at ICANN last year, we diverted all of the funding that we had from the meetings and workshops and you know, travel and so forth to, into our into, uh, innovative peace fund. Um, uh, including to our Afghan partners, but, but and elsewhere, you know, Cameroon, Yemen, etc. Um, our Yemeni, our, our our Cameroonian partners yesterday were talking about how, by being able to give people food and being able to provide the PPE and so forth, um, to, and and coming in to talk about peace and social cohesion, it it it. it not only gave them more credibility and access in their communities, just because they were combining, you know, people are hungry. They're not just going to come and talk peace or whatever, talk, talk about the issues they need. There needs to be substance. But, but by being, by demonstrating that they are addressing the, the local emergency needs and providing, and some, some of our partners are doing early recovery, you know, ch- training women and providing them with different ways of doing livelihoods for their families and so forth. But it shifts the dynamics in terms of, um, engagement and, and giving people the options of, of and the hope and the alternative life sort of lifeline, if, if you want. So that local level work is really important. And it should be it should be flexible funding because there are so many crises that people are dealing with. We can't we can't decide in Washington. Oh, today it's this. That's nonsense. It should it should you know, we should trust and we should invest in the trust that they've already built in their communities. That's one thing. The second thing, however, is that um, to the day that I retire or go, you know, uh, lose it, I will say it's important to be at the table where the discussions are happening because the assumption that, oh, we're going to have these conversations here, we're going to sign a peace deal, and then ladies get ready on the ground, we're going to give you a few thousand dollars and go for it and solve the problem is insane, right? It's the decisions are being made now. They are writing and crafting the future of an entire country. In, in rooms in Istanbul or Doha, backroomed conversations that Mr. Khalilzad is having with this, that, and the other. Wajma and her colleagues and young Afghans and others, they need to be there. They need to shape that at, at a minimum, they should have the opportunity to inform the conversation directly. And, and, and if they don't, if, if our government, I mean, if, if the Taliban so, so and so, 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 so called doesn't want to have Afghan women there, then why doesn't the US and why don't, why don't we encourage the Qataris and, and, and all of our Western allies to have Afghan women and Afghan youth peace builders in their own delegations? Why can't Wajma be a member of, you know, the American delegation? I mean, it, there's, and, and just, I mean, think about, Think about if, if January 6th, things had gone a different way in this country and the entire world was having a conference about the United States and Paraguay got to, got to come to the conference and say, hello, how are you? I have a, something to say about the United States. But American civil society, American people, the American population didn't. The American population that voted in the Democratic uh, candidate didn't have a voice at the table. It, it's... This, this, is, this is the absurdity of what we do to other countries. We do it over and over again. And the reason why it's really important to do it with, to, to change the paradigm right now with Afghanistan in however, as I say, put Afghan women in our delegations, invite Afghan women separately to come to the talks, change our envoys, make every single envoy female, to make the, appoint a Muslim, Farsi or Pashto speaking envoy for the UN. Just, just a female. Put, why not? Why not? Why shouldn't the UN be represented by, by 
somebody from the region that happens to be a woman who happens to speak their language and happens to know their religion. Just imagine the differences that that, that would make, right? We have to do it. And, and if we don't do it now for Afghanistan, what I'm worried about is that the same entities that have been, that push this, oh, we must end the forever war in Afghanistan by, by just pulling out the troops and not really thinking about the, the totality of the problem um, and setting Afghanistan on course for, forever, for war forever, basically, are going to do the same thing for Yemen. Because they're not looking at the politics of it. And you can't, again, you can't have responsible diplomacy or statecraft or governance if you're not really thinking about the redesign of your political processes to have the voices of stakeholders in, in the mix, local stakeholders who are going to live with your decisions. This, this, and, and so, so I, I, th I think we, need, we have to change it now. We have to you know, send them to Doha. Send, the, the Qataris want to have credibility and legitimacy as international um, mediators or facilitators for peace processes. This is the best practice. The AFP just produced its own report on this. The most effective, one of the one of the three most effective um, interventions in peace building and peacemaking is having women at the table. So why aren't we practicing the best that we can? That so that that I I wouldn't back down from that from that argument. Thank you. Hardin, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, I would just go back to one of the things I said in, the, in my opening remarks and also what Sanam has just doubled down on here. And this is the, I mean, again, the, the role of civil society organizations inside of Afghanistan at this stage. You know, I, I think making those investments, which we've made in, you know, to some extent uh, over the last 20 years, really needs to be the focus of our effort going forward. And I think in that conversation, though, it's more than just figuring out how to improve the way in which money gets distributed, right? Because like this conversation has a lot to do with how does USAID and others ensure that they can get money to local groups, uh, whether that's being done through a UN pooled funds or through some of the contractors or international NGOs. Yeah, that, those, those rules tend to be the thing that get in the way of that happening faster. Um, but really right now, I think you need to do a lot of listening, right? In terms of what are their priorities and understanding what they want, what they, what they need and what they're going to need over the next you know, three, four years, because they will understand what's going to be happening on the ground much better than anybody in any of the international organizations will. And so really having them involved in a much greater and deeper dialogue um, about what their needs are going to be in the development of the humanitarian space over the next three to four years, because they've all seen this movie before, right? And so I think having them in that conversation sort of at the shape stage of what that $3 million, $300 million package is going to look like uh, and, and really giving them a voice in that uh, decision-making process will be absolutely essential. And not just, let's get them a little bit more money, right? But have them be partners in, in figuring out how to, how to move forward. And if I could jump in on what I think suggest in terms of moving way forward, the first thing is to continue supporting the Afghan government. It's not just about individuals, it's an institution that we all have been putting you know, we voted, yes, we have challenges in terms of uh, governance, we have challenges in terms of service delivery, but this is a, an internationally recognized government that should not continue to be sidelined in the peace negotiations by the US with the Taliban. The continued support to international, uh, to Afghan forces, for example, we have 350,000 armed men and women in the police, in the army, who are defending the Afghan communities. Right now that I'm talking to you, I just got the video from Helmand, the south of the country, on how they are protecting the, the communities where the Taliban have taken a shield. They, the Taliban entered into people's homes and they are firing from those homes. And the army is actually, you know, defending those communities. So the while the U.S. military is withdrawing, we want the equipments, the, the military ammunitions, everything needs to be given or handed over to Afghan forces. But we saw the reports yesterday that they are destroying. So I don't understand like what is the rationale that they are destroying their equipments. You know, for all these 20 years, they have been training Afghan forces 
to use these military equipment. So what, why they are not being handed over to Afghan forces. The third thing is about like getting, we need an international mediator in this process, not Qatar, because Qatar is actually hosting the Taliban already. Qatar uh, does not have, you know, the already is on one side. It's like taking sides. So we need a, a much neutral, maybe the UN, if the UN, but of course, if the UN continues to, uh, to be, influenced by the international actors or powers then not the UN. But we need, you know, a country like Norway, maybe Germany, maybe another country in the world that actually takes the mediator role and bringing the, 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 all the sides together, but not giving the Taliban the equal uh, um, the participation so that they equally, uh, you know, um, participate they should get some percentage of the of the delegation not 50 percent the last thing i want to also say is that the continuous support should also mean that the I mean, countries in the region who keep funding the Taliban, who keep giving drones, who keep giving, you know, those military boots and military, you know, um, drones and other ammunitions, the RDX and all these explosives to the Taliban, they need to be brought forward because they are supporting terrorism. So where is the international accountability on, on the side of these countries? So there has to be an international, you know, sanctions on any state in the region. If it's Russia, if it's Pakistan, if it's Iran, if it's China, China. All these countries need to stop funding the Taliban. Qatar office, if it's not ending the violence in Afghanistan, we don't need it. Why is the US Congress continues to pay for the hotels in Doha while uh, Taliban are not actually, you know, uh, uh, seizing the fire? So why do we need the Qatar office? It should be closed. Thank you. Thank you. Gisu, you want to jump in? Yeah, I really condone what has been said just before me by my colleagues. Just want to underline one or two other points. The war stakeholders are in Qatar. The peace stakeholders aren't. Because people have to make peace in their city, in their town, in their village, in their region. Who are the people who live in Afghanistan? We don't talk about war victims. It's a large population in Afghanistan are war victims. There is not one family who has not been impacted in this war today, yesterday, and the yesterdays. Now, it's very interesting that if we were to believe that this is really a peace process, obviously one of the stakeholders, men and women who represent the victims. And it's not that we're rediscovering how you make peace as Sanam was trying to underline. There have been so many initiatives and South Africa is the only one. How can you not ask that demilitarization and laying down the arms not be one of the conditions, right? It, 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 it's amazing. So I just wanted to get back to the issue of really uh, victims of war who obviously have much to say. How can they make peace if they're not solicited? I wonder how. Only one last question, Megan, is that my colleague spoke about how young Afghanistan society is, but the average age, the median age is 90. And some of us are mothers or fathers. What is it we want for our 19 year old? Anywhere we are, anywhere we are. And that's what the 19 year olds in Afghanistan want. Guys, they want to go to school and they want to do their sports and they want to fall in love and they want to have a job and that's all they want. They are not crazy. They do not want to pick up arms. They have no issue on that. They want to keep to some of the traditions, not the reinvented traditions that we in our mega discourses say, this is a tradition. All this is reconstructed. It's a discourse. People, our kids want to live like any other 19 year old elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Sunam, I'll give you the last word. Um, so, you know, first of all, thank you so much for this, uh, for, for this opportunity and for having, and, and for everybody for, for speaking what, what's on our minds, which, is, which often we don't hear about. And I, and I hope that we can do more of this and I hope that other organizations in DC will do more of this. It, it's, it is, um, it is important to speak truth to power. And, and it's important because 
These things are happening on our watch in our generation. We are enabling not only terrorism on a massive scale, but a regional potential regional destabilization, which uh, the impact of which we are, you know, we're leaving for our kids. And I mean, kids here, kids there, it's, it's, it doesn't matter. So it's, we have to take responsibility. We have to try and stop this train wreck before it becomes even worse. Um, and, 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 you know, the, the argument that, oh, things will get better before they get, things will get worse before they get better. No, no, things can keep getting worse. We've all been around long enough. Those of us who work on conflict have seen it over and over again. Actually, what happens most of the time is things just get worse and worse and worse because we're not, we refuse to change what we do from, by, by, from the international side. We are at a point where we actually have good solutions. We have good ideas. We have, we're not saying don't pull out the troops. We're doing, we're saying do it responsibly. Do it, you know, walk and talk at the same time. Use the brain and it, this is so. So these conversations need to happen more. And and I and 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 I just want to thank everybody. And I um, salute my Afghan friends and colleagues um, for all that they're going through. Because as Rigisu said, if you were if you were the parents of a 19 year old now, um, and you saw this future for your children, the first thing you would be doing is packing your bags. How many Americans wanted to leave if they thought that you know uh, we were going to have the former president back in again? Just, just think about that on a massive scale. Where that, that's you know, it, it is, it is profoundly um, sad to see to see that the U.S. Has, is enabling this to happen to a country. Thank you. Thank you, Sanam, Gisu, Hardin, Wajma. You have been a phenomenal panel. Thank you so much for your passion, your insights, your great ideas. So what we've been doing is capturing all of the recommendations that have been surfaced here. So we're going to put together a little document, circulate it widely to all of you, um, because there's a lot of work to do in the coming days, and you've given us a great start. So just thank you so much again. Happy Mother's Day in advance to the mothers on the panel and watching. Hope you have a wonderful weekend. Um, and yes, much more to come. So stay tuned. Thank you.